The following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, they're leaving their country and coming back home. Arizona is beautiful, but it's not Israel. Hear how they're fulfilling prophecy along the way. Then, he grew up in a broken home. Women were good for two things. One, for sex, two, for abuse. She used to work for the Mexican mafia. I was looking at a very long prison sentence. Watch what rescued this pair. I just can't imagine life being any better. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. Well, it's official. The U.S. Embassy in Israel now resides in the capital of Jerusalem. Political and religious leaders celebrated the event, which took place on the 70th anniversary of Israel's founding. The historic moment was marred by violence in Gaza, where protesters charged the border fence with Israel. 58 Palestinians died when Israeli forces responded. Chris Mitchell has this report on the day's events. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin unveiled the seal and Ivanka Trump introduced the new embassy. On behalf of the 45th president of the United States on America, we welcome you officially and for the first time to the embassy of the United States here in Jerusalem, the capital of Israel. In a video, her father, President Trump, said his decision acknowledged reality. Israel is a sovereign nation with the right, like every other sovereign nation, to determine its own capital. Yet for many years, we failed to acknowledge the obvious, the plain reality that Israel's capital is Jerusalem. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called it historic. What a glorious day. Remember this moment. President Trump, by recognizing history, you have made history. Ambassador David Friedman hosted the event and told CBN News how he felt about the historic day. We've been planning for this for 25 years, and uh, thank God it came. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was just an incredible moment, one that will probably take me weeks uh, for me to process all my emotions. After nearly 23 years, the Jerusalem Embassy Act has been fulfilled with the Embassy of the United States of America here in Jerusalem. But some say it's not just history in the making, but also prophecy in action. We're seeing prophecy unfold. I don't know when the Lord's coming back, but I know today it got a little bit closer. This is also a prophetic moment because God promised Israel in the book of Deuteronomy concerning the nations. I will make you the head and not the tail. Others saw it as Israel taking its place among the nations. One of the most visible manifestations of the double standard, it was the only country in the world not allowed to announce its own capital. I hope we see the beginning of the end of that. And for the Israeli people, they will be treated like first class citizens of the world. And it also tells Israel's enemies, uh, this is their capital, the American embassy's here, now deal with it. Meanwhile, thousands of Palestinians rioted along the Israeli-Gaza border to protest the embassy move and also mark what they call the Nakba, the catastrophe that befell Palestinians when Israel was created. During the riots, Gazan officials said more than 50 died and hundreds more were wounded. The IDF drew up thousands of leaflets warning protesters to stay away from the border and blame the Hamas terror group for the uprising. We will not tolerate this violence. We will continue to defend our sovereignty, our civilians and our border. We will do so while trying to minimize the amount of casualties, but we will not let the rioters through and to harm Israeli civilians that are a running distance away. Israel said captured Gazans told them Hamas encourages children to cross the fence. They said they want the riots to be seen internationally as a popular uprising and not inspired by Hamas. Chris Mitchell, CBN News at the new U.S. Embassy, Jerusalem. Well, in other news, in our nation's capital, Vice President Mike Pence celebrated Israel's 70th anniversary with Christian and Jewish leaders. George Thomas has more on that. That's right, Pat. Vice President addressed a ceremony hosted by Israeli Ambassador Ron Dermer. There he prayed for the peace of Jerusalem. 
and pledged that the Trump administration will always be an ally of the Jewish state. One unalterable truth stands in evidence at this gathering and all across the world. As it has been in the past, so it shall be in the future. America stands with Israel. Pence also honored President Trump for strengthening ties between the U.S. and Israel. Stay with CBNNews.com for complete coverage of Israel's 70th anniversary and the historic embassy move. First Lady Melania Trump is recovering at Walter Reed Medical Center after being treated for what's been described as a benign kidney condition. Doctors performed a procedure to plug a blood vessel and stop bleeding. In the afternoon, President Trump boarded Marine One to visit her. A senior administration official said the president wasn't by his side uh, for the procedure, but he spoke with her beforehand and with her doctors immediately after. The first lady is expected to spend the next several days in the hospital. The Supreme Court is ushering in a new era of sports betting. State, uh, sports now, states now have the go-ahead to allow sports gambling across the nation. The Supreme Court struck down a federal law from 1992 that banned the practice in most states. Some governors are hoping this will help solve state budget problems. Observers note that the court's strong defense of states' rights doesn't bode well for the president's immigration policies, notably its attempts to crack down on sanctuary cities, which give certain legal protections to immigrants living in the U.S. illegally. A volcanic disaster is brewing on the big island of Hawaii with 19 lava outbreaks, a jungle on fire, and evacuations. As my colleague Dale Hood reports, the worst could still lie ahead. The ground on Hawaii's big island continues to crack open, spewing 2,000-degree lava. And now the volcano itself appears ready to explode. One of the newest fissures is shooting up what geologists call splatter bombs 500 feet into the air. I've actually seen rocks fly over the tree line. The eruptions, which sound like thunderclaps, are deafening. I heard what sounded like a jet turbine. 19 fissures have opened here in this corner of Hawaii's Big Island since early May. And fresh eruptions last weekend have forced new evacuations. More than 30 buildings have been destroyed and 2,000 have been evacuated from their homes. And officials warn thousands more could be ordered to leave. We would like them to be ready to, and prepared to evacuate at a moment's notice. The fissures are also spewing dangerous sulfur dioxide, which has residents lining up for respirators. Not everybody can just get on a plane and leave. Some people can and some people are, but the rest of us, we're here. The plumes of poisonous gas are killing off trees and grasses left untouched by the lava. All eyes are now on this crater where a lava lake has collapsed more than a thousand feet. If it reaches groundwater, that could generate steam-driven explosions, powerful enough to send rocks the size of trucks a half mile or more in the air. It's not like it's a hurricane where you think, okay, in three days it'll be here and go. This is almost like a slow motion train wreck. The U.S. Geological Survey warns there are 169 potentially active volcanoes across the United States, and about 50 of them in six states are being watched closely. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Pat, those are some dramatic images. And to imagine there are currently about 169 potentially active volcanoes across the United States. Well, you know, it's all tied into what is known as the Ring of Fire. Um, the whole Pacific area is, is uh, uh, well, around the edge is what's called the Ring of Fire, and it goes all the way from uh, New Zealand and Indonesia down into Santiago and Chile. You can see that on your screen. Well, the west coast of the United States is extremely vulnerable. And I read a very perceptive article uh, on this entire thing, the uh, uh, whole idea of that Cascadia subduction uh, is one that uh, could send walls of water throughout the uh, Pacific Northwest that literally flood thousands of acres and bring about, well, tens of millions, even billions of dollars worth of damage in that area. So Mount Rainier, and Mount Shasta and these other mountains along the Pacific coast in, in Oregon and in Washington state are part of that ring of fire. And uh, 
you know, the, the whole Hawaiian Islands, there was a volcano from under the, the ground, under the earth, that brought forth those islands. And uh, it's all volcanic, and it's a terrible thing, but it could, if it spreads to the United States, it's bad news. So, Wendy, uh, I, I'm, I, I don't want to be an alarmist, but those who are experts, this Cascadia yeah. effect is something that's very, very serious. Yeah. Like I said, the price you pay for living in paradise. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's the price you pay for living in, around the water. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure it's beautiful, but I mean, it, th this thing is very serious. And the so-called tsunami, when it hits, I remember that Indonesian tsunami, it was so horrible. But there was one earthquake under the Pacific uh, uh, Ocean. And when that happens, I mean, terrible things can go on, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just an earthquake, and then suddenly this wall of water comes roaring across the land. Pray it stays and, quiet. Hmm? Well, pray it stays quiet. Well, whatever. All I right. Know. Well, up next, it's called Aliyah, and it means going up. I'm Sarah from France. Hi, my name is Debbie. I'm from Cordoba, Argentina. Hi, my name is Gadi. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, I made Aliyah in December. Scott Ross explores what inspires Jews to make Aliyah right after this. Well, you're watching the 700 Club, and we're delighted to have you with us. And I might add, oh, we're still celebrating the 70th anniversary of Israel and the placement of the U.S. Embassy. You know, it's amazing. The uh, Prime Minister of Turkey has wanted to uh, withdraw r relations, I think, with the United States and Israel. We're not sure what he's going to do, but Turkey is turning more and more into an Islamic uh, dictatorship. It's not a very pleasant thing. And what used to be one of our you know, most reliable allies has now become an Islamic enemy. And uh, I think we've got to watch that. Well, back to Israel. There are only about 600,000 Jews living in Palestine when Israel became a nation in 1948. The new country needed citizens to survive. And I remember a story that one of the... Uh, Prime Minister told me about Ben Gurion, um, who was talking to Charles de Gaulle, and de Gaulle said, "What did you want? You want uh, more territory? You want some more money? You want an army?" And Ben Gurion said, "I want more Jews." And that's what uh, uh, de Gaulle said to Couve de Merville, who was his Prime Minister. Said Couve. He wants more Jews. Well, uh, CBN Scott Ross took a look at what happened when they got more Jews. Here's Scott. They come from all over the world to a place many have never been. Yet the Jewish people have longed to return to this land for thousands of years. I'm Sarah from France. Hi, I'm Dylan from Uruguay. I did Aliyah in December. I'm here because I love Israel. Hi, my name is Debbie. I'm from Cordoba, Argentina. I'm Nikita from Russia. Hi, my name is Gadi. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, I made Aliyah in December. Uh, I'm a lawyer in New York, and uh, I'm here because it's the only Jewish state there is. It's called Aliyah, literally going up. Taken from biblical times, the term describes when people went up to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. Now it means immigrating or returning to Israel. You're an American. Yep. <laughs> Why did you come? It's a beautiful country. I love it here. Yeah, Arizona's beautiful. Arizona is beautiful, but it's not Israel. Last year, 27,000 new immigrants arrived in Israel, including 3,600 from the United States. For almost 3,000 years, we were disconnected, but we were praying for Jerusalem. So it's a real gathering of exiles, and it continues every day. I spoke with Natan Sharansky, leader of the Jewish Agency, which oversees bringing the Jewish people home. I am very proud to be the head organization now, which brought three and a half million Jews from the creation of the State of Israel. Sharansky made headlines in the 80s as a political prisoner in the former Soviet Union. 
international pressure led to his release, and he immigrated to Israel in 1986. I meet with a lot of new immigrants, and I love to be in the airport and to see this moment of them going down from the airplane, because you think that after each of these people, there are at least 50 generations of Jews who are praying and dreaming about coming to Jerusalem. And each of them is closing a huge circle of 1,000 years of exile. Biblical prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel all spoke of a time when God would bring the Jewish people back to the land of Israel. The prophet Amos says they'll never be dispersed again. Although they're part of a prophetic and exciting journey, immigrants face a whole new world when they arrive. Some of the people left everything left the friends, left families, left the smell, the food, the jobs, all the things that they knew, they're coming here and they start the new life. That's why the state works to create a smooth transition. Ziva Avrahami leads Beit Canada, Opan Etzion, an absorption center in Jerusalem. New immigrants live here free for five months so they can focus on learning Hebrew and living in Israel. We called him the first home in the homeland. They're coming here and they have like a soft landing. They don't need to be afraid from things. We help them to be part of Israel, but step by step. How important is it that they learn Hebrew? The main reason that the people are here in this absorption center is to get to know the language. The Hebrew is the key to the Israeli society. If you want to be part of Israel, if you want to be the leader of this beautiful country, you need to know the language. Upan Etzion is mainly for millennials who have a university degree. You could say it's like a prophetic melting pot. Are there conflicts between them, culturally, socially, uh, adapting and adjusting to one another? Yes. There are different people for different places. The culture is different, the language is different. So to put together 250 young yes. adults in one place, you can imagine oh, what's yes. going here yes. in the evenings. A lot of people are becoming friends for life. Do the majority of them then stay in Israel? The first year and the second year are the hardest one. And if you survive the two years, people are staying in Israel. This is gonna be their home. I spoke with some of the students about their experiences. I think it's the land of the Jewish people and right. that is why I'm here. I want to essentially come home and to be with my fellow Jews and to please God find a Jewish husband. Why did you come? Well, I came to Israel because I feel uh, this is the homeland of the Jewish people. And for the first time in 2000 years, we have our own homeland oh. and we can build a prosperous Jewish state. And I think that's very exciting to be a part of. What kind of work would you like to get into? I studied uh, accounting and finance, so hopefully something in that area. Do you want to get married? Yeah, for sure. That's why I'm here in Israel. There's plenty of uh, really? beautiful Jewish girls, and let's hope I can find one of them. As Sharansky prepares to leave his role, I asked if he thought all the Jewish people need to come home. Our prophets speak about it very clearly, about this grand design of in gathering of the people of Israel in the land of Israel. And I want to help the people to make this decision, not by giving orders, not by pushing them, even not by shaming them, but simply by giving them the feeling how good it is. Scott Ross for CBN in Jerusalem. What's well, amazing, the millions and millions that come home, well, that's of course what the Bible said. I've dispersed you to the nations and I'll bring you back home again. It's all prophetic, it's all in the Bible, it's all prophetically being fulfilled. It's very exciting it's to very see. very exciting. I was in Israel one time covering an event like that yeah. where three huge planes landed with with Jews from, I guess, three different countries, I think, or maybe two of the planes were from America. But, you know, they were, they, and in fact, I think they start celebrating when they're in midair and they cross yeah. a certain airspace and they start waving their flags. And it's, it, it is a huge celebration. But of course, a lot of work once you get there to learn the language. Mm -hmm. I studied, I tried to study Hebrew for like a, a few months online. It is so, it's a very difficult well, language. It is, yeah. you know, but, uh, uh, they have uh, Ben Yehuda uh, was the man who brought about uh, modern day Israel, and um, he he and his wife, when they were they were on the plane and so forth, uh, he wouldn't have any relations with his wife at all because he said our our baby has got to be born in Israel. So they had a child born in Israel, and um, it's amazing the story. Uh, but he had a revelation. He he saw 
so uh, had a vision. He heard a voice about the, this new language, and and he brought forth a modern day Hebrew. They had to, they had he had did a, a whole dictionary. I mean, what did you do with modern terms? And you got to go back to the Bible and pick up a language, and then you've got to find. Uh, you know, a, a language for an airplane and a typewriter and a computer and that kind of stuff that wasn't in the Bible. So he, he created this, this new language, uh, Eliezer ben Yehuda. Amazing. The son of, uh, and there's a street over there, ben Yehuda Street. Mm -hmm. uh, but th that, that uh, I, I met with, with his grandson, who was an older man, but it was a very uh, inspiring time to talk to him about what his grandfather had experienced. Yeah. But anyhow, it's a fulfillment of prophecy. It definitely is, Pat. Well, to support Israel and celebrate its 70th anniversary, CBN has released a new documentary on DVD called To Life, How Israeli Volunteers Are Changing the World. To Life tells the story of five amazing Israeli organizations that are transforming lives across the globe. And this is your opportunity to stand with Israel and bless God's chosen people. Call now to receive your DVD of To Life. It's our thank you for just $10 or more. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to CBN.com and you can share this DVD with friends and family and help us to spread the true story of Israel's heroism and help to the nations. Well, coming up, an orphan from Kenya is starved and beaten by his aunt with her stilettos. See how he's rescued and given a new life here in America. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Talk about significant life change. Eric is a young orphan from Kenya who could be the poster boy for that. After his parents died, the aunt he was forced to live with abused him horribly, even beating him once with her stilettos. But today, Eric has a promising future ahead of him right here in the United States. Today, thanks in part to the help of CBN's Orphan's Promise, Eric dreams of becoming a lawyer. But just a few years ago, his only focus was survival. After my parents died, I went to live with my uncle. My aunt didn't want me around and treated me like a servant. She didn't feed or clothe me. One day, a teacher who could tell he was starving gave him some bread. When his aunt found out about it, she was furious. That day, she beat me with the heel of her shoe. I still have a scar over my eye from it. I ran away many times and slept on the ground in abandoned shops. So this was the kind of place that you stayed? Yeah. When you would take off? Yes, this is the kind of place. What was it like at night? It was very cold. I prayed to God to intervene in my situation. His aunt eventually took him to a children's home supported by Orphan's Promise. There we gave Eric all the love and care he desperately needed. I never thought I'd have the life I'm living now. Being here brought joy back into my life. We also enrolled Eric in a private Christian school where he's a leader in his class. I believe God has called me to be a lawyer. I want to help children going through the same things I went through. With the help of Orphan's Promise, Eric recently moved to the United States. Come on in. Hi, Eric. How are you? We helped him find a foster family that'll live with until he finishes high school. Then he will study at Regent University. My aunt beat me and got rid of me, but God used that suffering for a much bigger purpose. Thank you to everyone who fed me, gave me clothes, and gave me an education. Because of you, I will be able to help others. I love you all. <laughs> If you are a partner with CBN, you help change that young man's life. And if you would like to, if you're not a partner, but you would like to do things like that, this is your chance to go to your phones right now and say, yes, I want to join the 700 Club. It's just 65 cents a day, $20 a month to change so many lives and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we have something for you when you do that. It's past new teaching on angels, their power, their purpose, and their presence in your life. Some amazing stories of people who had real life encounters 
with these heavenly mysterious beings. And Pat talks so much about angels and why they're important in our lives. The Bible mentions angels about 60 times, so they're definitely important. And if you'd like to know more about angels, this is our gift when you join the 700 Club. Well, up next, an explosive marriage detonates. Michelle reached over and just started punching on me. There was such chaos and um, craziness happening in our car. When he actually reached over and punched me in the face, um, of course I was just, I was hysterical. Watch what happens next, coming up. Wow. Right now, I want to introduce you to the Hunters. Tommy was raised in a culture of violence, had a raging temper himself. Michelle had been involved with guns and drugs and worked with the Hells Angels and the Mexican Mafia. The two of them got married just four months after meeting, and the combination quickly became toxic. When Tommy and Michelle Hunter met in 2008, they were both new Christians healing from troubled pasts. Growing up, they'd both been victims of emotional, physical, and sexual abuse, leading them to lives of anger, brokenness, and violence. Um, my mom was a single mom. She uh, dated a few guys who were extremely physically abusive. And I specifically remember one time a guy coming in the house and beating my mom up. And I mean, I must have been three years old, I think, at the time. And I remember taking a plastic machine gun and beating him over the back and trying to get him off of her and him throwing me across the room, you know, for um, what I was trying to figure out for 40 years was why was I so mad? Why was I so dysfunctional? And why um, things around me always seemed to fall apart? Most of my life, I just, I was involved in drugs and guns and, um, you know, I worked with Hells Angels and um, Mexican Mafia and uh, I just really was very purposeful at going the opposite direction from God. And um, when I was 30, everything pretty much caught up with me and I was looking at a very long prison um, sentence and uh, God rescued me out of all of that miraculously. When I was let out of jail, and didn't have to spend 20 something years in prison, I made a decision that I needed to change my life. After four months of dating, they married. But after only two weeks, the honeymoon was over and the reality of their unresolved pain was revealed. Yeah, the physical and verbal abuse that I experienced created um, a mindset that women were good for two things. One for sex, two for uh, abuse. Tommy would get mad. Um, he would, his rage and anger would just overtake him. He was all about intimidating. And so there was a lot of screaming and yelling and shaking his fists at me and pretending like he's gonna headbutt me. So he'd get real close and just like rawr in my face, you know. Michelle turned to prescription drugs to cope with her husband's rage. But I felt like if I was really numb, I could keep from myself from being really upset or um, I could stay in control of myself, meaning I wouldn't lash out, lash out at him. I wouldn't start crying. I would just be like, don't care. Meanwhile, the couple managed to mask the tension at home while serving as trusted ministry leaders at their church. There was a perception in our church, I think when people looked at us that we were you know, this great couple and um, my husband was so charismatic and he was a great preacher. We would go to church and we would play church and then we would go home and it would be very destructive. As the years went by, the arguments escalated. One evening after dinner and drinks, the violence became physical. What happened in the car was because of the language that I was using, um, Michelle reached over and just started punching on me. There was such chaos and um, craziness happening in our car. When he actually reached over and punched me in the face, um, of course I was just, I was hysterical. Police arrested Tommy and he was taken to jail. Once released, he reunited with Michelle. A month later, she found out she was expecting and gave up prescription drugs. Five months into her pregnancy, she caught Tommy cheating, filed for a separation, and moved from California to Arizona. 
Without Tommy by her side, Michelle gave birth to a stillborn baby. Distraught and desperate for a better life, Michelle cried out to God. I'd been through so much in my life before, and I considered myself to be such a strong person that nothing that ever happened to me would break me. But I was really broken. Um, I got a hold of some teachings um, about the love of God. Like, who am I? Like, I'm not just a, a wife or a mother. Like, who, who is Michelle? Who am I? And um, I started really, like, chasing intensely after the love of God. It was like I was resting and relaxing in just His presence. So it wasn't a show anymore. It wasn't about going to church and doing the Christian thing. It was about being a Christian alone in my room with Him. Now divorced, as Michelle allowed God to heal her heart, Tommy was finally dealing with his anger. And I started looking at it, and I really broke down 1 Corinthians 13 and so many other scriptures about love, um, that uh, this was what I had desperately been searching for my entire life. Because he was so patient and because he was so kind, it was that I knew that he was for me and that he had my back and that he wasn't mad at me and he wasn't disappointed in me. He just saw me as his son and he loved me so much and he had so, such, such a great journey for me ahead of me. And there was a true repentance that came in that moment or in that time frame. The love of God filled me with compassion, understanding that my husband was very broken, that it wasn't that he was an awful, horrible man. It was that he was just as broken as I was broken, just in different ways and it looked different. And I just knew that no matter what, I was gonna believe for restoration of my marriage. Michelle reached out to Tommy, committed to showing him the love God had shown her. As God healed them both, they longed to be reconciled with each other. When Tommy asked Michelle to marry him again, she said yes. Tommy and Michelle vowed to never engage in physical abuse again. Today, they find freedom and healing and wholeness as they share their testimony around the world. Together, they lead a marriage ministry and are pastors of His Place Church in Long Beach, California. My marriage is the most amazing thing I've ever experienced in my life. Um, I am married to a big teddy bear who just loves God and who loves me and um, loves himself. Because you know, you can't give away something you don't have. And for the first time, I really have love. And so I'm able to give it to her and everybody else. I see Jesus in our marriage today as the center of our marriage. Is that when we wake up in the morning, our goal is to be Jesus to each other. It's to love like He loved. Um, today, I, I just can't imagine life being any better. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing what God can do? But you know, underneath there's so many people inside, they're broken, they're grieving, they've been abused as children, they've seen things happen that no child should ever see, they've been starved, they've been beaten, they've been having all these problems. And, and they, they get married to each other and those pathologies come out and they start uh, exhibiting those things to one another. You probably have a marriage like that, don't you? Some of you feel that way. You've had that thing and your husband or wife screams at you, yells at you, physically abuses you. You wonder what's wrong with them. What's the matter? What have I done? And oh, it's so painful. And you grow up that way and, and oh, is there any way out of it? And so instead of a place of beauty and love, marriage becomes a place of hell and torment. I want to ask you right now, would you like to be free from that? Tommy and Michelle found the Lord and the Lord brought out what was really good in them because there's good in all of us. In every one of us, is, there's some good in there. You may be mean, you may be part of some motorcycle gang, you may be on drugs, you may have killed somebody, you may have been in jail. But there's some good, there's good in you. And the Lord wants to bring that good out and make you the person that He intends you to be. Would you like to fulfill what's intended for you and would you like your marriage to be a wonderful place? 
Well, if you would, I want you to pray with me. Let's turn that whole thing over to Jesus. Let's ask him to come in and do something for you. Just pray with me right now. Don't be afraid. These words, pray with me. Jesus, that's right. Jesus, I give you my life. You know what's in there. You know the good that's there. And you know all the bad and the evil that I have done and I've been exposed to. And God, I ask you to set me free. Set me free, Lord. I give you my life. And from this moment on, I want you to bless me with yourself that I might live for you and be part of your family. And Lord, with my marriage, take it and breathe on it and bless it. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen and amen. Now, if you prayed with me, I want to give you a little something. I've got several pieces of literature, but this one is called A New Day, and you've just given your heart to the Lord. I was privileged to, some years ago to go into our audio room and make a little DVD. It says, what do you do? You've just come to the Lord. What about sin? What if something is done to you? How do you live for the Lord? What's his destiny for you? And I'll give you this free if you just call in right now. Say, look, I just prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to the Lord. My marriage, God's going to take care of it. I'm going to see something wonderful happen. There's hope, there's blessing. So call in right now and say, look, I've just prayed. I, I've given my heart over to the Lord. Our telephone number is toll free. It won't cost you a thing. It's all free. It's one 800 700, 7,000. It's easy to remember, 700, 7,000. And so I'd like that new day. I'd just like to, you to know if you don't want to give us your name, that's fine, but you call anyhow. Call right now because somebody's on the phone who loves you. You want further prayer, they'll be glad to do it. Well, Wendy has an interesting guest coming up on the show, and let's go to her right now. Here's Wendy. I sure do, Pat. Coming up later, she was shamed in front of Oprah's 20 million viewers. Today, Jill Donovan joins us live to reveal how her most embarrassing moment led to the creation of her million dollar business. The bodies of 20 Egyptian Christians murdered by ISIS in Libya three years ago are now home. In 2015, ISIS marched the Christians onto a beach and beheaded them on camera. Libyan officials announced Monday that the remains were returned to Egypt. The Coptic community recently honored the martyrs by erecting a new church in their hometown. Hundreds of people from around the region paid their respects in the church on its opening day. It was supported by the Egyptian government to honor the slain Christians. In Indonesia, police say a family brought its seven-year-old daughter to a suicide bomb attack on a police station Monday. That's a day after members of another family coordinated suicide attacks on three churches that killed 12 people. Six civilians and four officers were wounded in the police uh, station bombing. The little girl survived. You can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. My friends Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Jill Donovan tried for five years to get a ticket to be in the audience for the Oprah Winfrey show, all to no avail. Then, one day, she got the chance to be part of the show itself. For Jill, it seemed like a dream come true, but in reality, it turned out to be anything but. Jill Donovan was selected by Oprah Winfrey producers to discuss the do's and don'ts of re-gifting. As an avid re-gifter, etiquette experts called her tacky and unacceptable. 
in front of Oprah's 20 million viewers. Jill was mortified, but God helped Jill turn that embarrassment into success. Laying in bed one night, um, I was watching TV and I saw a girl making cuffs and I had collected cuffs for the last 10 years. So I got up that night with this renewed passion to then start doing something again. And from that night on, I taught myself how to make cuffs online, every book, every thing that I could get a hold of. And um, Rustic Cuff was born because of that. Today, Rustic Cuff is a million dollar business that boasts celebrity customers like Kathy Lee Gifford, Miranda Lambert, and even Oprah Winfrey. Well, please welcome to the 700 Club, Jill Donovan. Jill, good to see you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you for having me. So you're a huge fan of the Oprah show. So how did you, uh, how did you get to be a guest on the show? From the time I was little, I had started a new hobby every year. And I ran out of hobbies to try. And so I was going to try to be a guest at the Oprah show one year. And that turned out to be a five-year effort to get just to be, not a guest, just to be in the, just audience, in the audience, just to be in the audience, not a guest. I didn't want to be a guest. Oh, I just wanted to be in the audience before she retired. Okay. And so through a crazy turn of events, they were, you couldn't get a ticket to the show, but they were looking for people to be on the show. Right. And so whatever they were looking for, I was going to be. So what happened, Jill, the day that you finally were a guest on yes. the show? It was a, it was a show about etiquette and they were looking for regifters, <laughs> and, and they were going to tell me whether it was proper or not which I thought it was proper to regift. Yeah. And it turns out it wasn't. And I didn't know that until I got on the show. So it was embarrassing and and I gave up regifting after the show and I swore I would never do another hobby again nor would I ever regift again. So how did that negative response? I mean, it really had an impact on you. I remember leaving there and telling my husband, I don't know why why would God bring me to the stage here to be on the stage with Oprah to have this happen. Yeah. And when I could have just been in the audience and I said, but I have a strong feeling there's going to be purpose to all of this pain. And there was. there was. What happened? How did God turn that terrible embarrassment into something positive? Five years later, I decided to just l let it all go. <laughs> I didn't hold it hard for five, five years, but I just was, I just said, okay, I'm going to move on. I'm going to start again. And I started the hobby of making cuffs, bracelets, yeah. and started filling this closet that I had emptied out of all my gifts, regifting closet, and filled it up with cuffs and started to regift them and gift them myself. Now, did you feel that you had come full circle when you saw Oprah actually wearing one of your Jill yes. Donovan cuffs on the cover of her magazine? That was crazy. Two years, th three years after I started, I received a letter from Oprah and said, congratulations, you were chosen to be on the wrist of Oprah Winfrey on the cover of her March issue. Yeah. And it was a cuff that I had given to Gail King, her best friend, and Gail had worn it on the CBS Morning Show, and then I see the same one on Oprah. Wow. Yes, that was a crazy moment. Now, did she, did, did Oprah know how devastated you were after that day that you were actually a guest on her show? I don't think so, because I held it together. Yeah. I, I, I held the tears back. Um, no, I don't think so, and it really wasn't, it, was, it had nothing to do with Oprah, really. It was just, it was the way that the etiquette experts felt but about regifting. But I am curious, because you've got a chapter in here about regifting. I mean, you were, you were a proud regifter. Proud. And <laughs> I, still, I still am. I'm just not as loud about it. But I guess this is national TV now. People will, but I'm curious. Will know. I mean, I, I, okay, can I just confess? I've done it. Yes, I but, saw you doing it before the segment started. <laughs> On the side, I saw it. <clears throat> but how, how do you how do you do how do you regift with um, integrity? I guess <laughs> that's my second book, regifting with integrity. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> but, but now that you mention it, it's a great title. I think you just. Of course, if you want to give me anything you're wearing, I do, as a matter of fact, then I, I'll, I'll take it. Right? This, yes, as a matter of oh, fact. Oh, look this at this! Right this yes. is not planned. This, this no. Is, this is definitely this not planned. This says um, one day at a time. <gasps> Oh my God. But this I don't want you message. to regift that like I saw you do earlier. I need you to keep that on. I actually <laughs> think that uh, this is a message from God for me right now. Really? Because I, I love to rush. You know, like, yes. uh, you know, I want to get things. I, I saw you rushing over yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, okay, I'm, I've just become a big fan of regifting because now I'm wearing one of her bracelets. Okay, your business, uh, Rustica, very successful, but it's more than a business. It spawns something that you call the kindness effect, which is the title of your new book, yes. The Kindness Effect. What is the kindness effect? The kindness effect is something that or organically happened uh, through the making of cuffs and cuffs. It's really not about the cuffs. It's just the venue that God used for this to happen. Yeah. Uh, we have people that come in and 
visit us in the showroom and they will literally buy dozens of bracelets just so they can turn around and give them away when they feel prompted to. And we see that happen countless times every week and we see lives change just through a cuff, but it's not about the cuff. Yeah, and you say really it's about what happens between two people when yes. a gift, I mean, it, it's, the Bible says it's better to, to yes. give than to receive. Um, and so it's really about that connection that happens when you, when you give something. Yes. You think that the person who is receiving it is the one who's going to be so blessed. And what you realize is the person who gave it, their life begins to be changed because they start look, stop looking inward and start looking outward. And you see lives change just through giving. Okay. And real quick, what is the message you want people to take away from your new book? I would love for people to know that God can take your mistakes and your pain and your vulnerability and turn that into something extraordinary, even when you cannot see it. Yeah. Well, yeah. hey, if Oprah's wearing it, it's good enough for me. And I love, I love, I love silver too. And oh, you didn't know that. So I will, gold one was on this arm and for whatever yeah. reason I moved to silver <laughs> to give that. <laughs> All right. Well, Jill's book is called The Kindness Effect and it's a, available wherever books are sold. It's also got some information on the regifting that you don't want to miss. So you can also hear more from Jill in our social exclusive interview that's on Facebook. To watch it, just go to facebook.com slash 700 club. Jill, you are so much fun. God Thank bless you. Thank you, Wendy. You. Same to you. Thank you so much for having me. All righty. Well, up next, your questions, honest answers. Kathy says, I believed I was healed by God, but my sickness came back. Why would God heal you and then give the ailment back to you after you praised him for your healing? Pat tackles Kathy's question and much more right after this. All right, it's time for your questions, some honest answers. Let's start with Kathy. She says, I believed I was healed by God, but my sickness came back. Why would God heal you and then give you the ailment back after you praised him for healing you? Pat? Well, you remember Jesus gave a teaching about a demon. He said, you know, after the demon is cast out of a person, he goes into arid land seeking someplace and then uh, he goes back to the house that he left, and he finds it swept and garnished, and he brings seven more worse than himself. Mm. Uh, so uh, disease, you know, has a certain life to it. Some, some diseases, uh, they're like, like animate creatures, and they want to go back to the house where they left. And you have to fill that, that void with something, and that's what the teaching was. You have to be filled with the Spirit of God. Uh, and that disease is gone, but you, you somehow are welcoming it back. It isn't God putting it back. It, the, the, the disease wants to come back, and you receive it. Mm -hmm. So you have to begin to stand against these things. Yeah. So th that's all I can say. Yeah. Amen. Whatever. All right, here's one from Bell. How do I know God can hear me? I've been praying to have a family of my own and for help in my struggle with polycystic ovary syndrome. Am I being impatient? Well, I don't know enough about your circumstances to give you a legitimate answer, but uh, of course God hears you. But uh, you remember that story about uh, Daniel praying and uh, the angel came to him and said, look, I've been fighting the Prince of Persia. It took me a while. You've been fasting and praying, but uh, I've, I've been having this battle, but I'm, I'm on the way. You just you know, have to be patient. So I, I think... God's answer is on the way, but you have to be patient. Never stop. Always pray. Continually pray. Continually seek God. Continually thank Him. And you'll have an answer, all right? All right, here's one from Kathy. She says, my friends can all hear the Spirit of God talk to their spirits. I gave my heart to the Lord years ago, but I don't hear His voice. Could I be unsaved? I have felt unloved for years because of this. Uh, I imagine all of your friends, I don't know that many people hear the voice of God. It's very unusual. It isn't something that all your buddies hear God's voice. If they do, that they're faking it. I, I, I really believe that. I mean, in a sense, if we're open, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. But uh, God speaks to you from the Scripture. He speaks to you from, you know, circumstances. He speaks from a lot, a lot of ways. So. Just open yourself, and the Spirit of God will speak to you, all right? All right, here's for Elaine. She says, our church won't let anyone serve unless they tithe. 
Is that biblical? I can't find it in the word. We tithe, but I've known people who were hurt because of this policy. They wanted to serve in various ministries, but were not allowed to. Um, I, again, think that's unbiblical. I, I don't understand anything that says you've got to give a certain amount of money in order to serve God. I don't, I don't know that. But I think, uh, you know, God loves a cheerful giver. And I think as we give joyfully, he will give back. Uh, but uh, to, to, to say, well, you can't serve, that I don't think is biblical. Well, today's Power Minute comes from the book of Ephesians. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you.